Hello, Ranjanjit. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Let me introduce you, and then uh, you will start your, your talk. Okay? Sure. Okay. Okay, so Ranajit uh, comes from the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Uh, actually, where are you? In Nigeria, in India? I'm in India right now. Okay, so it's, it's the evening, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's about 8 p.m. now. Okay. So, uh, Ranajit is a plant pathologist uh, with experience of research and development uh, in Asia, Africa, and Americas. He guides uh, the research and development uh, related to, to uh, crop disease and mycotoxins uh, at uh, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria. And uh, he works on the development and the scaling up of uh, aflatoxin uh, biocontrol technology called AFLASAFE. And uh, Ranajit is going to uh, tell us more about this, uh, this AFLASAFE project. So, Ranajit, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you. The slides come on, then I will start. And, but before that, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, to this workshop. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, with you, although virtually. Uh, so that's the, to the topic of my presentation. I um, I used to lead the program. Right now, I am an emeritus scientist, having retired from IIT last year. But I still guide the program as, as an emeritus. Okay. Now, in terms of IIT, who we are, is very briefly, we are a not-for-profit not institution, and we generate agriculture innovation to meet Africa's most pressing challenges. And we work with various partners across Sub-Saharan Africa. We are a member of CGIAR, and uh, it's a global partnership. And I think you may be familiar with CGIAR. We lead the CGR research for delivery work in continental Africa, and IIT has actually delivered more than 70% of CGIR's impact in sub-Saharan Africa. And incidentally, the major impact has been on biocontrol of mealybug. Uh, that has contributed about $7 billion to African agriculture. We work in, in five hubs uh, in uh, West Africa, the Sahel zone, uh, Central, Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. So that's about the background of my institution. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm describing here is a long-term uh, project. It's, it's uh, started in 2003 and it's continuing. Um, and I led it for about 20 years and now Alejandro Ortega Beltran, he leads the program. And as I mentioned, I guide the program. And we have a multiple, many, uh, many people in, in, in the program itself. Now, in terms of what we want to control, it's actually aflatoxin. And I'll be going very quickly with these slides. Uh, it's a highly toxic metabolite that is produced by a fungus. So our, our, our intervention for biocontrol here is a, a fungus that produces this nasty toxin. This particular fungus resides in soil and crop debris and infects crops both in the field as well as in the stores. And while doing that, it contaminates food, feed and milk. Climate change is increasing the incidence and severity of aflatoxin. And as a result of which about 2.5 billion people are chronically exposed worldwide. It is an extremely toxic compound and it's, it is potent at extremely low doses and it, it, it can lead to death, liver cancer, immune suppression, stunted growth in children. It affects animal, animal productivity and negatively impacts on trade. Uh, it impacts on many crops, maize and groundnut being the most, most common. Uh, and this is what you can actually see in one of, one of the groundnut production areas in Senegal, where a huge mound of peanut is lying, but it's, it's not completely covered. And if you closely examine the, the kernels, you will actually find the kernels infected with, with, with aspergillus flavus. Um, <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, so aflatoxin actually impacts on public health. 
Uh, and actually, 30% uh, of all liver cancer cases in Africa is, is, is attributed to aflatoxin. It impacts on trade and economy. Uh, about 40% of um, local crops are affected by aflatoxins. Uh, Africa loses about $100 million annually because of lost potential export, and there is food and nutritional security that, that are affected. And aflatoxin actually gets into news headlines quite often when governments ban import of uh, contaminated maize from other countries, or when people die, or when um, companies are unable to actually procure safe maize from, uh, uh, from the market, local market. Now, in terms of what Af aflasafe is, um, now, as I mentioned, aflatoxin is produced by aspergillus flavors, and the fungus is there in the crime. And um, if the conditions are not right or the fungus is not toxin producer or strain, then you may get actually safe crops of two, up to 20 parts per billion. In case the conditions are bad for aflatoxin production and if the strains are highly toxic, then you can get very high levels of aflatoxin, including up to 48,000 ppb, which can kill a cow. Now, there are different kinds of strains of aspergillus in the, in, in, in the field. Some produces a lot of toxin, others don't produce any toxin. So we look for the atoxygenic strains that are naturally occurring in, in, in the field and we can use them as biocontrol agent. And that's what we normally use. Now, what we do through a, a long research process, which, are, which I'm not gonna describe here, we identify four superior local strains that are highly adapted and they have wide distribution in nature. They are highly competitive and they have defective aflatoxin producing genes. And these four strains com compose a multi-strain product. Uh, we produce spore powders and these spore powders are, put in, are mixed in water and a polymer and a dye. And then they're coated onto sorghum in a, in a production plant using a seed treater. And finally, the product that you see is a blue colored uh, granular product uh, that contains the fungus on, on the surface. Now, there are, we have actually developed both country specific products and regional or multi-country products. There are 15 Afrasafe uh, Afra products uh, out of 19 registered aflatoxin biocontrol products globally. So 15 of them are, are in Africa that are registered by IIT and partners. Now, how does it, how does the technology work? So what the farmers actually do is just take the product and just broadcast in the field uh, about two to three weeks before flowering. So it's a pre-harvest technology. And when they broadcast in the field within two to three days, the spores on the, on, on the carrier, they begin to sporulate. And as a result of that, those spores actually uh, would, would disperse onto the crop and, the, and it will be dominated by this green uh, dots, which are non-toxin producing strains. Compared to uh, a non-treated plot where most of the strains that are found are toxin producers. So basically what we do is competitively displace the toxin producers with the non-toxin producers. And as a result of that, um, we get long-term protection. Now, in terms of the efficacy itself, uh, after application, I'll just show you the results of about 12,000 farmers field trials in many countries. And what we find is there is about 98% reduction in aflatoxin treated uh, fields. These are farmer fields, these are not small plots. And uh, at harvest time, and about 92% reduction in in uh, in aflatoxin in, in in after storage so you do see a large amount of reduction now after we register a product or while the registration is ongoing we start the process of commercialization and we follow a well-structured process for commercialization and that is first to develop a country-specific aflatox aflasafe commercialization strategy and in the strategy, we actually talk about, we try to define uh, how big is the problem in a country, uh, what are the general market uh, possibilities, how, what are the different market segments and what are the demand scenarios, the potential ad uh, addressable market, feasibility of production and distribution, 
manufacturing options, public versus pro private. And there are a whole set of activities, including, uh, including the, the financing plan. Okay. And then once we have that, we invite investors uh, to express uh, uh, interest in, in the technology. And based on the based on of interest, we invite two to three companies to develop business plan. And uh, once they develop the business plan, and we sometimes support them with development of the business plan, and the commercialization strategy actually helps in development of the business plan. We review the business plan and select uh, a suitable investor. And then the investor is contracted and sign, and they sign a technology transfer and, and um, licensing agreement. Uh, and the license is usually a limited exclusivity agreement or non-exclusive agreement. And this is to actually further the attainment of objectives of CGIR principle of broadest reach and accessibility. Um, uh, and so that's the two kind, kinds of uh, license that we actually ask for. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, where we are. Um, this is where we are in May 2023. Um, AfraSafe work is going on in 22 countries in Africa. There are 15 products uh, registered covering 11 countries. There are six factories that are operational, three factories that are under construction. Out of the six factories, um, only one is uh, by IIT and the rest of them are either public or private companies. Uh, the, these investors have invested about $9.7 million. In fact, it's more than that in, uh, in, 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 in funding. There are 10 companies that manufacture and distribute in 16 countries, and there are more than 100 distribution points. Um, about 6,000 tons of the product have been produced to protect about 600,000 hectares, and more than a million tons of aflacive uh, maize or peanut have been produced until now. Nevertheless, uh, the availability of the product has expanded significantly, although it has, it has happened. The uptake is still limited to aflatoxin conscious core market segments dominated by large processors or structured value chain, basically. Okay. Um, a few impact stories. I'll not go into the details of this, but in Gambia, the groundnut, they, the farmers have been able to actually export groundnut. Uh, there was a project in Nigeria through, through that, about 32 businesses, they, uh, they produced about 213,000 tons of aflatoxin safe maize and about 95% of those lots had uh, low levels of aflatoxin. And these farmers actually gained uh, about 16% of net annual income over the, their normal income. And the use of the product uh, and use of the AfraSafe uh, grains also increased in, in smallholder households. Similarly, in Burkina Faso, now some of the companies, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they have stopped importing peanuts from outside to produce uh, RUTF, which is ready to use therapeutic foods. And in, in, in Kenya, uh, one of the government projects, they have applied it and they, they actually met 99% uh, of the maize in, in that scheme met the standard of, of Kenya. And nearly half a million people benefited for one month uh, uh, for, by, by consuming aflatoxin safe maize. Now, what are the value proposition and value network as we are asked uh, to actually do it here? Now, in terms of whether it's a product or service, it's actually both a product and a service. So, so product as, as it is, as I mentioned, is, is, is the AfraSafe. It's a bioprotectant for better for aflatoxin mitigation. As a part of service, it's licensing fee that the manufacturers actually provide us. We provide them in technical backstopping to the manufacturers and distributors by training them in terms of training the manufacturers, training the farmers, they, we also provide advocacy and help them in developing the market. And there are certain service at cost, for example, the active ingredient is supplied at cost to the manufacturers. Who operates it? 
IIT and partners, we developed the product, we tested it, registered it, selected the investors, licensed, and we technically backstopped those manufacturers. In terms of development investors, in fact, most of the research and, and development has been financed by development investors and national governments, and so they provide the financing. The registrants, IIT is registrant of the product in all countries except Kenya, where the national partner and Zambia, again, a national partner, both government partners are registrants. Now, the private companies, they come into the picture because they manufacture and distribute. There are three cases here in Nigeria. There is a company called HIL. In, in, for Senegal and Gambia, there is a company called Bamtare. And in Tanzania, there is a company called A to Z Textile Mills. In terms of distribution, again, there are certain companies that do the distribution. They have distribution agreements uh, uh, like UPL in Ghana, AISL in uh, Malawi, Afla Livre in, in Mozambique. So these are all local companies except UPL. The public institutions, uh, we we actually manufacture uh, in, in ITA uh, in, in Congo. Very soon, this is going to be given now to the private sector. Now, the public, private public is, for example, in Kenya, the manufacturing is the government Colorado, whereas distribution is by corporate UPL, which is a pretty well-known uh, multinational company. <clears throat> now, in terms of value proposition, it's, uh, it's highly effective. It's commercially available. It's simple to use one application per season. It has got multi-crop and multi-season benefit, which means that, that there's a carryover of the uh, inoculum from one season to the next. It's cost effective. It has got high toxicological and ecotoxicological safety. It's called WHO class U rating. Uh, it use often ensures that the crops are consistently low uh, and has acceptable level of aflatoxin. And it's approved for aflatoxin management tool by national governments and international agencies. Now, in terms of business model base, what are the motivation of various actors? Uh, so for R&D partner uh, like us and, and the national government partners, uh, the, we have a mission of providing safe food, higher income and more trade. So through this technology, we, we try to meet those obligations. In terms of development investors who funded these, uh, this work, it's poverty reduction, nutritious food, improved health and livelihoods. In terms of national government, uh, poverty reduction, again, they want more trade and they want to ensure that people have safer food. For the regulatory agencies uh, who are also our partners, they want to see safer food in the market and they want to actually see responsible use of the technology and quality control of the, techno of the product itself. And after say manufacturers and distributors, they want to diversify their business, they want more profit, and they also do it as a part of corporate social responsibility because of the public health benefit that it provides. The farmer groups, the commodity groups, and aggregators and food agencies, they are really important in terms of uh, producing safe food and higher income. And so they are also partners in our, in our, in our, in, in, in our network. Uh, he, international humanitarian agencies and NGOs like WFP, uh, UNICEF, uh, they also want to provide safe food for improved health and livelihood, so they, they support us. Public and private extension agencies for improving farmer knowledge, the domestic traders and, and export traders, and they want to see more, more income and trade, and they want to comply with after aflatoxin standards uh, globally. The media partners, uh, they want to create awareness about food safety and, and improvement uh, and how to improve food safety. And the consumer organizations, they create awareness about food safety and, and protect the health. Now, I don't want to explain this, but this is an ecosystem in which different actors actually interact with each other. And so it, it's, a, it's a complex thing and it actually changes from country to country. And if you see that where AFRASAVE actually comes in is a small part in the pre-harvest and harvest areas, but it has a great amount of impact throughout the whole value chain and various actors in the value chain have a great role to play to ensure that biocontrol is effective and it is used by farmers.
Now, what are the contributors, uh, gains and, and, and levers? Uh, you know, the network participants, R&D partners, we provide the knowledge, we provide the human and technical resources, skills, and, and in sometimes money. The development investors, they provide money. They also are great advocacy. Uh, in advocacy, uh, they also provide knowledge and, and connections. Uh, the national governments uh, and regional uh, organizations, they also do the same thing as development or, um, partners. Regulatory agencies, they actually guide us in product registration. And so we, it's been a partnership with the regulatory agencies for registration of the products. The manufacturers and distributors, they help in scaling. They are the major uh, the vehicle for scaling. They provide the financial resources, human and technical resources. The farmer groups, commodity groups, aggregators, food agency, they create the demand and they provide the advocacy. Okay. And, and, and then international humanitarian agencies, they also are in demand and advocacy partners. The extension agencies, they uh, provide the training and, and knowledge, export and domestic partners. Again, they are great for demand and advocacy. Media partners for communication and advocacy and con consumer organization, again, for advocacy. Ranajit, w one minute left. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, uh, the gains, uh, so one is consumption of, uh, of safe food. Second is greater trading op opportunities. Third is about improved food safety. Third is about higher uh, livestock productivity and profitability. And finally, comp increased competitiveness of, of local and, and other markets. Uh, again, uh, for development, uh, development potential. Uh, so basically, there have been several instances that in increase the importance of aflatoxin in, uh, in, in, in each country. Uh, and some of the examples I've actually provided here, and some of the turning points have been funding from the German government, from the Gates Foundation and USAID. There are projects for in incentivization, the registration of the first AfroSafe product, and, and then a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional project team that we have. And when AfroSafe was incorporated in the National Agriculture Investment Plan of six countries and the support from the African Union and from the regional economic commissions. There are several risks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I will just talk about perhaps the, the risk of the challenges and risk. One is low awareness. Second is limited premium for quality. The market doesn't distinguish. Political stability and conflict has been an issue. For example, in Sudan, uh, we had to stop the project because of conflict right now. Policy changes, sometimes government actually provide incentives, sometimes they actually take it off. The low purchasing power of smallholders, the low enforcement of aflatoxin standards in Africa, and then limited Af uh, access to aflatoxin testing, the, and limited extension uh, support, and uh, sometimes farmers don't adhere to the application guidelines, and sometimes infrastructure, for example, road uh, in Africa. Now, this have been a, a, a multi-institutional and multi-partner project and we have been fortunate to get support from many partners and many donors and we are grateful to all of them and because of which we are where we are right now but there's a long way to go uh, we are not still there as yet thank you Thank you very much, uh, Ranajit, for this very interesting talk. Is there a question here in the room? We have time for a few questions. Yes, Aura. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I liked it very much. And uh, just one question, do you have an idea about the mix of public and private fund? Because you said that it was a mix of public and private. Do you have a rough uh, number figure to see what is the part of public and of private funding? Thank you. Right. So in terms of most of the funding for development came from, uh, came from public, which is basically uh, foundations and governments, uh, including your own government, actually, uh, for which we are really grateful. 
uh, in terms of the public the public uh, the private they have invested more than 10 million dollars i think i talked about 9.7 million dollars in terms of investment with respect to setting up the factories itself but in addition to that they have actually provided i have not included the uh, uh, the human resource cost or all the distribution networks that they have actually created all the awareness that they have created so i think their contribution has been quite substantial i can't put an actual figure on that but i think it's a good idea we'll try to collect that data but the contribution of uh, the private sector in terms of scaling has been phenomenal and i think uh, and, and uh, without that contribution the scaling would not be possible at all because we initially tried doing it ourselves and we failed and so it was quite it was quite uh, apparent and that's the reason why we had a separate project called after after safe technology transfer and commercialization project funded by the gates foundation usaid through which the scaling actually took place but the private investors provided a lot of input uh, not only financial but other sorts of input into the whole picture I and mean, i if, if you ask me i would put it around 15 to 18 million dollars i mean more than more than about the same as the infrastructure that they have put in thank you and okay. in terms of public money, uh, public, yeah, money yeah. Would be about, public money would be about 50 million 60 million dollars over 20 years oh. thank you thank you for this answer very short question, Jonathan, yeah. please. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've maybe you mentioned it. How long it takes uh, from the start of the project to where you are now? How many years? Right. So it started in 2003, uh, and this is 2023. But the first product that we developed, it took us eight years. That was a project, not eight years, I think seven years of the project to registration and setting up a factory itself. But uh, subsequently, our product development time has been shortened because uh, we have made the whole product identification process more efficient, the commercialization, the investor selection process more efficient. So right now, from start of a product development, identifying the strains to providing a license to the company it takes us about four, four, four to five years now. Thank you. One very last question, very short and very short answer, please. Thank you for this uh, complete presentation. I just, I'm not surprised, but is it working? Well, I'm not surprised, but I just wanted to mention something on the slides with the motivation of the participants none of them talk about the quality uh, of the environment and biodiversity, for example. That's true. I think uh, except for some of the donors, they don't talk about it, about biodiversity. So the one other thing that we try to promote in, in, uh, in our talks is that uh, what AfraSafe does is actually create a safer environment for Afri uh, a safer community of aspergillus in the environment. I don't know, aspergillus is not only uh, a toxin producer, but is also an allergen. And, 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 and therefore, this is something that we actually uh, emphasize in our, uh, in our, uh, in our technology um, communication that it does make the environment safer uh, by reducing the amount of uh, toxic aspergillus in the environment. Uh, now, in terms of biodiversity, uh, one of the selling points of this actually product is that the product uses biodiversity of each country to develop the products because it's a native. And uh, we actually screen uh, about 5,000 native strains to and and identify these four highly diverse uh, aspergillus strains and non-toxin strains that compose the product. Okay, right. I mean, we don't talk about it. I didn't mention it, but it does have uh, inbuilt uh, implications. Right. 
Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time to move to the coffee break. I uh, thank you again, Ranajit, uh, to, uh, you. for your presentation. Uh, please, there are questions in the, sh in the chat, if you can answer. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh,